All right. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, international conference. My name is Kai Ming, Kai Ming Shi. I'm currently a professor at the uh, Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, please allow me to start sharing my screen for the topic I'm going to present today. So bear with me a little bit by making this uh, full screen. So uh, the topic I would like to uh, bring out today is about one of our research on what we call the peripheral chemical as an important environmental pollutants and how it actually react with the calcium under the thermal conditions. Um, so let me start with the, uh, a little bit more introduction of myself. Again, I am uh, teaching at the Department of Civil Engineering at the University of Hong Kong, and we have a research group, so-called environmental material that I established just about 14 years ago. And in our group, we primarily working on all different kinds of material that are relevant to environmental pollution prevention, resources recovery, and also what we call decontamination, which means study how the pollutants behavior on different type of surface. Uh, when I say surface, it means material surface. So today's topic is more on the absorption behavior of a very specific, uh, specific type of uh, chemical, what we call uh, peripheral chemicals. And over the year, we publish probably more than 250s in SCI journal papers. So we have uh, quite uh, a strong interest in working on all different kinds of material and how they behave in the nature environment. So first of all, I would like to bring you understand a little bit of so-called the peripheral chemical. It is a chemical with uh, a long chain carbon bond and all the hydrogen supposed to be around it um, have been already replaced by fluorine. So we all understand when you have a fluorine replacing the compound, usually this compound becomes very difficult to be biodegraded. It becomes what we call environmentally persistent organic pollutants. Um, the problem of environmental, the uh, persistent environmental pollutant is of a great attention in environmental study because uh, this type of pollutant can resist to chemical uh, process, uh, degradation process, biological process, also uh, photolytic process. So you will stay in the environment for a really, really long time. And when you have a pollutant stay in the environment for a really long time, you have a problem that it will be transport for a really long uh, distance without being destroyed. It will accumulate in human animal tissue and it will very easily to go into the food chain through what we call biomagnification. So this is also closely relevant to our agriculture and also our food safety issue. And unfortunately, this type of chemicals are uh, very everywhere. Uh, we can see the, um, the sun, packaging material on the surface. It has a little bit more oil uh, texture. It can prevent water. It is basically consists of the PFC. And also uh, a lot of the textile that is marketers that would that the air go through, but not water. Those things are all because of the PFC property. And a lot of what we call a non uh, sticking pan, uh, carpets, uh, even electronics and also the firefighting floor. All of this use the gray, the gray property of the PFC and this is basically everywhere. Um, the type of the compound is extremely, in fact, complicated. It can have all different kinds of variation. It depends on what we call the functional group. You can have the sulfonates at the end, you can have uh, carbon hydro, uh, carbon as carbon acids over there at the end. So it's carbon acids, um, or even some different kind of form. And depends on the numbers of the carbon, they have different length. Then you can have different kind of uh, PFCs of different lengths in the environment. One of the difficult part for this type of chemicals is even very difficult to measure. So when we have a chemicals we want to measure, we usually use uh, uh, liquid uh, chromatography and then use liquid, and use liquid chromatography. Then we use some spectrum, for example, to measure the concentration. 
However, uh, most of the, li the liquid uh, chromatography by itself actually has been already contaminated by the PFC uh, pollutant. So we are talking about an instrument by itself already being contaminated because the, uh, the material used inside the instrument has this type of chemical. Also, uh, a lot of uh, chemical reagents like methanol that we usually use for uh, as a dilution phase for a carrying phase in the uh, uh, so-called the uh, uh, liquid chromatography by itself will also be a contamination source. So the innovation that we had before uh, that we're the one in the, uh, in the world that first used the so-called PFC isolation column to basically delay and separate the signal of the PFC in our sample and together with the PFC in the machine. This is what we have done. For example, if you use just a brain sample and you put in the machine uh, and you will still find you have PFC, but actually we, we are in, in our sample, we don't have anything. So what we have done was uh, we have used the uh, PFC um, uh, isolator column. So we will bring the signal a little bit forward. So you basically let the uh, contaminates signal goes out a little bit, uh, goes out a little bit later. Then uh, when you when you really have a sample that contains certain amounts of uh, this type of chemical, then you can start to separate the signal. So this is a polluted signal. This is a real signal. With this uh, very useful method innovation, we start to look at what about the wastewater that we have in typical urban environment in Hong Kong? Then uh, are we going to really have this type of uh, a PFC pollutants go into the nature environment? And we are very unfortunately find out, yes, in the wastewater, uh, this type of pollutant will be grow uh, into wastewater. And then we understand wastewater needs to be treated, but actually this chemical cannot be degraded. And later on, this chemical will go to the nature environment, depends on where your wastewater goes. However, so we find a PFOS and the one that was the seven carbons, and also PFOA, the one with the six carbons, uh, for train, uh, uh, the, the foreign trains are all found in the wastewater with certain concentrations. However, something we have to understand is that uh, in the wastewater treatment plant, it's not only just the wastewater treated. It is also including what we call the sludge, which is a solid phase that will come out from the wastewater treatment process. So if your PFC will be in the wastewater after treatment, you will either go to water phase or either go to solid phase. So we further look at what we call the sludge, um, look at their concentration of PFC. We find more alarming song, uh, alarming signal is that as you can see the PF particularly with PFOS, accumulate huge amount in the solid. So it's telling us that, and also some of the PFOA, but much relatively small concentration. So it's telling us that if you have these type of a PFC uh, uh, pollutants, uh, for, uh, chemicals, and then you have it in the product, and then once you use it, a lot of them flush into wastewater, and then the wastewater will have some PFC and a huge part of that would also be in what we call the sludge. And this triggers something very, very uh, important in our environment and also in our agriculture activity because uh, he, history wise people have been using the sludge from uh, the wastewater for a lot of agriculture activity because sludge has a nutrient like nitrogen, phosphate, and potassium. They are great, they are great opportunities uh, for an even very traditional type of agriculture activity. Up to today, uh, people in fact collecting the uh, wastewater sludge for a large land applications, either put in the landfill or even put it on the agriculture land. However, this trigger a new problem that people start to worry about once you have this type of the land application, doesn't matter if it's in landfill or if directly used as a fertilizer on the farming land, then uh, this type of chemical, uh, before chemical, may end up in the food chain and eventually goes to the human's body. And this is unfortunately already happened. If you look at a lot of research, they still find, they start to find out that human bodies and all different kinds of animals, they are having such perforated compounds 
accumulate inside their body. They can be measured from the blood, they can be measured from the animal's blood. So this trigger, a, 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 I would say quite scary scenario and people really do not know how to deal with that and even don't know the consequence. So our job is to see how this type of uh, chemical transport in natural environment. And we find out that if this chemical goes to the mural, for example, the uh, alumina based mural, uh, on the surface, it will be kind of rich equilibrium about uh, 48 hours. Compared to some of the previous study, it will consider it will stay in the uh, um, uh, so-called diffusion process, go to stability stage uh, around like 10 days. And um, it, it will be much faster to be attached on the surface of the mirror and, and, and reach equilibrium. So something that will be a good uh, information to know However, if you look at the capacity, different kind of chemical has different kind of capacity to stay on the surface of mirror. Uh, because we want to say the natural environment has a huge amount of mirror surface right there. So we find a PFOS will uh, absorb more on the mirror surface, like this one we use the aluminum surface. Then we find out um, uh, we should really pay attention on the PFOS, this type of chemical. Uh, they tend to be on the surface instead of in the water phase. Uh, a lot of people consider uh, because of different kinds of functional group, therefore their uh, surface attachment may be mostly what we call the chemisorption, chemical absorption behavior. But we find out in addition to chemical absorption behavior, it also go to what we call electrostatic interaction because when the solution pH is different, for example, when the pH is very, very uh, low, then the surface of the mirror become very positive charge. And this type of negative charge pollutant would like to absorb on the surface way more. So it is not only just the chemical absorption behavior, but also the physical uh, part of the electrostatic interaction is also controlling how much of the chemical it will be absorbed on the surface of the mirror. More interestingly, that we also find out that uh, the absorption behavior of this kind of chemical is also affected by the solution composition. For example, if you have a lot of calcium in the solution for PFOS, because we find out the calcium uh, will actually acting as a bridge, binding two chemicals uh, in, the so in the solution phase together. So they will be more difficult to absorb on the surface. So you see that higher calcium concentration is actually uh, decrease the absorption of PFOS. Similar things also happen in a PFOA. But in this case, both calcium and magnesium, both of them can be so-called a bridge, acting as a bridge, you're holding the pollutants in the solution. And therefore, once you have very high calcium or um, uh, magnesium, like in groundwater, then you actually have a slightly less uh, absorption for the PFOA on the mirror surface. However, we also understand in nature environment, we're not only looking at the mural, we also have what we call the organics. So the organics will also affect the absorption of this type of chemical, depending on whether the long chain PFOS with seven carbon or so-called BF, BUS. Uh, if you still remember the BUS uh, that I listed in the very beginning, the table is very is a very short chain. I remember it's a three carbon chain, so it's very short. Uh, molecule compared to PFOS. Let's look at how their reaction to different uh, type of material. If it's again only on mural surface, we find both of the uh, PFOS, BF, uh, BUS, long chain PFOS and short chain, their uh, assumptions on the mirror surface are relatively this, quite similar, although PFOS is still a little bit higher. But if you have certain organics, let's say uh, humic acid on the surface modifying the mirror surface, we find the PFOS has slightly higher uh, absorption behavior compared to BFUS. So in fact, put it this way, if you have a, a, a completely mirror surface, then the absorption doesn't matter the chain, the, the carbon chain is longer one or shorter one. You pretty much see similar amounts of the absorption of this type of uh, uh, peripheral chemical on the surface of mirrors. So if you are having this um, pollutant discharge into somewhere that does not have like very dry area, then uh, without much organics, without much uh, uh, water right there, 
then uh, photoorganics and metals to accumulate, then you probably pretty much see the distribution of both long chain uh, preferred chemical and short chain preferred chemicals are pretty much the same uh, in terms of their absorption amount. But if you see this type of pollutant being uh, discharged into more a uh, humid weather area, then you have a lot of organics that can modify the surface of the mirror. You start to see the differences. You start to see the PFOS will probably be more preferred to stay on the um, surface, comp uh, the, 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 the particle surface, the soil surface, and the PFBUS will be probably more being distributed to the liquid phase. So we'll go with the water. Um, the reason is because the PFOS may have the uh, electrostatic uh, attraction between the mirror surface together with the pollutant. At the same time, it also has a little bit of what we call the long chain uh, hydrophobic part that can interact with the humic acid, which is also relatively more hydrophobic. So that part uh, get this uh, PFOS uh, having a relatively higher absorption capabilities when you have the uh, uh, organic matters like humic acid modified the surface. So that um, very nicely explained the fate and chance for of the pollutants, how they got generated, how they got distributed in the wastewater, how it goes to either wastewater or sludge, and then when the wastewater or sludge got used uh, for either agricultural activity or even discharge into nature environment, uh, for the dry soil, for the wet soil with more organic content, which, you know, uh, which part it will go to. So we, we saw that uh, a mystery quite nicely after quite a number of years of work. And uh, we encountered a new challenge right now because uh, when we were uh, quite clear about, say, uh, this type of chemical goes to landfill, what would happen to that? People are telling us, okay, then uh, if you consider this type of chemical uh, would be so environment, uh, would be so environment unfriendly, it's difficult once we uh, uh, discharge into the environment, doesn't matter with the wastewater form or sludge form, how about we just burn it? Or how about we just use so-called thermal treatment process to deal with sludge? Because then it's supposed to be just, just burn out and we solve the problem for all. So-called thermal treatments, and usually we, we, a lot of people think about is what we call incineration, which is burning. That's usually the highest temperatures uh, uh, treatments, which is okay, but you may or may not be afford to do that all the time. So you may have uh, the lower temperature, like the drying, sludge drying is very common technology people use for treating sludge or even use for gasifications. And these different range of uh, temperature for you to choose are within what we call the thermal treatments range. However, uh, we find out a very um, unfortunate news again, because uh, uh, if you simply have PFOS under high temperature, try to gasify it to so make it into gas. Yes, you will become gas space. So you don't have PFOS as a, as a pollutant, either in a liquid or solid anymore, but you create a new type of air pollutant we call fluorocarbons. So this type of fluorocarbons um, are, will be created as, uh, you actually know the chemistry because it's a carbon, it has, it has fluorine, boom. It's basically just the, the overall product uh, in the areas of fluorocarbons. And these fluorocarbons are what we call very, very highly, uh, 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 what we call greenhouse gas uh, potent. Uh, it, if we know that uh, each part of the CO2 will have one effects of, of the global warming uh, potential, uh, each part of this type of uh, what we call the uh, for preferred carbon is we're talking about several thousands, so several thousand times worse than uh, these, uh, the uh, CO2 uh, as a greenhouse gas effect. So we have to figure out how to deal with it. We cannot let this type of preferred carbon to be emitted during the burning process. So one of the, the, the trick that we have been working on for so long is that we're quite good in working on calcium type of material. So we were thinking when you have a sludge that need to go for thermal treatments, sludge's composition is quite complicated by itself. And at the same time you have a PFOS, 
taking as an example of the PFCs. Can we use the calcium source to really mitigate this problem? So it's actually a really good idea to make him, uh, the reaction goes by having additional uh, triggering by the calcium product or calcium material, whatever you can find. So uh, first of all, we look at the, uh, the thermal reaction of PFOS. We find very interestingly, uh, this material is pollutant by cell. It will de start to degrade at the temperature about 425. So which means after 425, then uh, your um, so-called uh, the uh, fluorocarbon will start to emit. All the solid becomes gas phase. We have the um, uh, uh, DTA again further confirmed uh, with the uh, pretty much uh, with the heat flow uh, at above uh, or below uh, 425 is our insignificant, which means bef below 420, uh, uh, 425. The, 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 the pollutant by itself is actually very strong. It, it doesn't really go for a uh, gas phase as always stay there. And, but after 425, then the fluorocarbon starts to, to grow. Um, so we start to add uh, a calcium source into the sludge and try to see whether how it will react with the PFOS uh, in the sludge. And the, again, the goal is to minimize the fluorocarbon coming out as a gas phase. But we will end up with what we call the ash when we do the thermal treatments. Say even in the highest temperature incineration, you will end up with uh, you will end up with ash. If you go for sludge or drying then you will start have the dry sludge. So we're facing what we call the solid material. The solid material would be the final product and we have to figure out what the solid material is or from the solid material, we understand whether we really stabilize the fluorine uh, coming out from the PFCs by adding uh, the calcium source. In this experiment, we basically add the uh, um, calcium hydroxide, but it doesn't matter, I think, if you have calcium carbonate, you have the calcium oxides, and I think this all work. It's just basically supporting the calcium for that. And once we have to deal with so-called the solid right here, that we have to we have to start to deal with the material. And one of the important techniques to deal with materials is what we call X-ray diffraction. That basically use the X-ray to shoot into the crystal, and then use the uh, the, 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 the crystal, because crystal structures have atoms occupied in different positions. So that kind of uh, um, diffraction pattern that we observe after X-ray shoot through the crystal will give us some uh, good information to analyze. So uh, these days, uh, every lab have this um, X-ray diffractions uh, or at least every big lab should have one. And then you can have the signal to tell you which face, which murals actually end up in your uh, treated uh, uh, your, your treatment process like the edge that we're talking about in order to know how the uh, fluorine has been stabilized or not. Uh, one thing I, I like to say why we like calcium is uh, we actually work with uh, oyster uh, research before with biologicals and colleagues because uh, during the process of the oyster uh, growing, they have the larvae and they actually start to calcify what we call the bio uh, uh, mineralizations um, they, it's like a bone, like a baby's, uh, a baby oyster. They have their small bone to be grow. At the time, they are in what we call a rogonine phase. And then we're, we, we very nicely use X-ray diffraction to, to confirm that. And then later on, when they grow into the oyster, they become so-called calcites. So this transformation process is very interesting. And we use to deal with this type of uh, uh, calcium source a calcium type of material with our X-ray diffractions uh, technique. So we find that's, that's something that we can do uh, much better than the other people. So we add the calcium into this source and we find very interestingly um, at, remember if I, if, if I may uh, remind you that before 425, that PFC compounds stay, could stay stable. But in fact, before that temperature, when we add calcium, we are like say 350 the lowest, we are fine, we have a new phase coming up, which means a new fluorine phase, which means we have, before the fluorocarbons emitted, we already successfully convert some of the fluorine into the, uh, the calcium fluorine. And that's very exciting because we find a new way 
to stabilize the fluorine before it got emitted as a fluorocarbon as a very, very strong uh, 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 greenhouse gas potential. So that is giving us a great uh, uh, excitement. And we find out, say, at 400 degrees Celsius, so for example, 400 degrees Celsius, the, uh, the, again, the PFOS is still not being vaporized into gas phase yet. We only need five minutes, then we can actually uh, have a substantial amount of, uh, of the uh, 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 calcium chloride there. But if you let the temperature go a bit higher, say, you know, we're talking about 600 uh, or even a little bit, uh, even higher than 100, like most of the incineration temperature, we only need to use less than two minutes, then <clears throat> the fluorine can be uh, successfully being stabilized. Okay, so we, we start to use the real sludge. We, uh, to test that, we find out, yes, in fact, we, we, we do observe the calcium fluoride generated 400 or even six, 600, 900 at high temperature. But we also find one more type of mineral that was generated because in the, in the sludge, you have, for example, a phosphate. So we have this phase uh, with calcium phosphate together with fluorine, we call a fluoroapatite mural that can be formed. And in this case, we start to know what will happen in the system. <laughs> but for an engineering point of view, uh, if you want to really have a technology development, it cannot be just knowing what will happen, but, uh, but, but you have to also know how much it will happen. So in the typical X-ray diffractions, we only know, for example, I have X-ray diffraction observed, I can match, match it with two spec, uh, standard spectrum, and I know uh, phase one, phase two, but I cannot tell how much of phase one, phase two. So it's just like a natural environment. You can have all different kinds of things mixed together, but in order to just know who they are, a very important thing for engineering the answer is that you have to answer how much or how many of each of them. And that comes to uh, what we call the simulation of the atomic structure of each mirror phase using what we call reiterative refinement to really match the observed X-ray diffraction peaks and know how much each phase will actually be in your sample. So th this part goes to a little more complicated and it goes to the, the structures and uh, um, atomic calculation. I won't go too much about that, but we have that skill for a really long time. And uh, we, we, we probably about, uh, I would say more than 100 papers that we publish is all based on this skill. And one very important thing that we can use this skill is that we use what we call fundamental parameter approach because typical X-ray diffraction peak will have the signal mixed with both sample and instrument. And we have way to use the standard material to get rid of the uh, instruments. And then everything that we have for our analysis in that case is simply the, the refract from the sample's property. And that will give you accurate um, the quantification capability at the same time, we all understand uh, every material has what we call amorphous content. And uh, we use what we call internal standard method, doping certain proper internal standard material as what we find out over the years. And we can later on calculate each uh, phase. Uh, each crystal phase is very accurately together with knowing how much amorphous phases right there because you may have a lot of amorphous phases instead of uh, um, having the crystal phases only in the system. So with this uh, very important skill, then we start to really run to the frontier of this uh, scientific research combining with the engineering need. For example, uh, we, we say that we should add calcium to help with the furring capturing uh, but how much calcium we have to add. So we start to use different ratio of calcium fluorine. Uh, we find out probably, I think one to one will be enough. Uh, it, it doesn't matter with the lower temperature, higher temperature. I think you don't need to add a, a, a too much calcium. Um, it actually has quite good efficiency when you quite good uh, um, effects. Once you simply just use one to one ratio, that can actually catch things quite well. So uh, then how about the temperature? Um, high temperature, of course, spend more money. High temperature will also limit our applications. 
if we have a lower temperature, like in 400 degrees Celsius, a lot of the sludge drying process can be at that temperature. So we're talking about even a lower sludge drying all the way to incineration, this technique can be all applicable. We're talking about the efficiency of capturing can be between above 60% for sure, if not close to 70% at low temperature all the way to probably close to 90% of the fluorine capture. It's a huge amount of fluorine that can be captured. And what about treatment time? That's what I already say that at lower temperature, you might need close to about five minutes, but at high temperature, you can really shorten this process within just a few minutes. So once you have a much shorter reaction time, it gives you a great possibility to design your process. And very efficiently, you don't really add too much cost of your process and you can capture the fluorine very nicely. Okay, so uh, once we have the um, real sludge, we have, if you still remember what I'm saying, that the uh, floral carbons, uh, the floral appetite as part of the potential phase, they can stabilize the fluorine. So the total, say at 400 degrees Celsius, the total fluorine capture is this amount, and the majority is contributed by calcium fluorides, no problem. 600 degrees Celsius, almost the same, mostly contributed by calcium fluoride. But be careful that once you have higher temperature, then the uh, so-called deferral appetite uh, capability of capturing uh, the fluorine becomes relatively more observable or so-called more noticeable. It's still in this, ten, in, in, in this condition, it's still not as high as uh, calcium fluoride, which means the one that really helps you to capture fluorine in a system from the PFCs is still calcium fluoride. But at high temperature, you should pay attention your fur appetite also start to contribute some. More importantly, when you start to go for higher temperature, one thing you should also pay attention is that, say above the 600 degrees Celsius, then your calcium fluoride capture capability will start to decrease. And at the same time, what you actually have is the capability of fur appetite, cap uh, uh, capturing capability start to increase. So this is a very interesting temperature that give you um, a, a different switch of different mechanism that happening inside your search, uh, heating, drying, incinerating treatment process that tells you different mechanisms over there to control a different percentage of the flooring that you want to fix. Okay, so at low temperature, again, you will see pretty much most of the fluorine stabilization contribu is contributed by calcium fluoride. That part goes all the way correct. Doesn't matter how much calcium that you add in the system. But very interesting that if you are having a lot of calcium in, this, in, in the system, like for example, when we condition a sludge using a substantial amount of calcium, then, which is very likely, then you need to be very careful at high temperature. There, there's a point where your, your uh, so-called the, uh, uh, the, the, the flooring fixture, the, the, the flooring fixing capability is no more the calcium fluoride, but the floral appetite. So again, at high temperature with high amounts of calcium, then the mechanism that help you to stabilize the flooring in the solid phase becomes what we call floral appetite. So we find this very interesting from the uh, PFC to be burned into high temperature, either goes to uh, calcium fluoride or even to uh, floral appetite, or even you know something we don't want it, uh, that let them release into the air as the, uh, as the floral carbons. Uh, we figure out all the pathway and we use the engineering tool to optimize the pathway that we want and minimize the pathway that we do not want. So this is, I think, a very interesting example that we use our, um, our, our scientific knowledge and skill to contribute to the green technology advancement in dealing with the, uh, 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 the um, PFC type of uh, environment problem. So overall, I just want to say uh, when we invent a lot of new tech, uh, green technology uh, for the waste, for the wastewater, they're all good, either for, for burning incinerate, uh, incinerating municipal solid waste or incinerating the sludge, everything. 
have we actually noticed the fed and transport of the new pollutants? We are not just treating the, uh, the traditional pollutants and traditional type of topic. We have to also pay attention to a lot of new pollutants, environmental pollutants come into our daily life, end up in our waste, end up in our wastewater, end up in the sludge. It will actually affect our natural environment. And when we use whatever new technology to treat them, how they are well treated. Are they actually creating newer problems, more serious problems that we did not pay attention? And I think that require all of you to join us to look at this very important uh, fields of the environmental topics to help advance uh, green technology to a safer, more efficient method, uh, method for all of us. So overall, I mean, I was a lot of the uh, X-ray diffractions and to some degree, myself I wrote a book about X-ray diffraction and later on with uh, the consequence of different kinds of waste that we're dealing with. We also have a co-author paper on environmental materials and waste, try to contribute more of the knowledge to our development of a green technology. If anything that you think we can further help your research or help you, your knowledge yes, of your learning, feel free to tell us. Thank you very much for um, um, paying attention on my presentation today. Thank you.